promise you, when you buy and read this book, you will be too. And I have to tell you, people have had such amazing things to say about your book, Coil. And I think it's so aptly described by Shobha Day as an outsider insider novel, a must read by Twinkle Kanna, a remarkable debut. I would really love to welcome you all and thank you so much for being here. It means the world. It is so hard to write a book and pour it out on the pages where you can no longer go back and edit and change what you wrote like you can on social media. When it's out there, it's in print and it's a labor of love. So please, one more round of applause for Coil for this fantastic, beautiful debut. Amazing. All right, so let's begin with Suhana. Thank you so much for doing this today. <laughs> it's the first time you're having a conversation like this, and I know we're all kind of jittery, so if we're smiling extra, I think yeah. it's we're hiding our nerves. <laughs> so just throw us some love. But I'd love to know what made you want to be here today, and what makes you want to talk about this book. Um, firstly, thank you so much for hosting this conversation and moderating it, and thank you, Koel, for having me here and choosing me to launch your book. Um, I think what I loved about this book was that the writing, the way that you've written this book, it's so accessible, yet it's full of contradictions. Mm -hmm. And even the characters, they're so flawed and so real, but relatable at the same time. Um, and But what I think I loved the most and what resonated with me the most was that at the heart of it, this book is about friendships. And I find myself quite lucky um, to have a set of friends that hold up a mirror to my imperfections. Some of them are sitting in the audience, which I was quite pleasant. And applause for the friends! Now. Yes! Yeah, I'm really so happy. Um, but yeah, and also friends that hold my hand during the tough times as well as the good times. Um, and what I find beautiful about friendships is that friendships defy logic. They can come from anywhere. Um, Coel and I are friends. We're not from the same generation. What do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> what did she mean? <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> Ignore that one. Okay, we're not from the same city. Ah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, but we're still friends. I don't know how, but we're still friends. <laughs> um, and yeah, that's why I'm so thrilled to be here and doing this with you. I love it. Absolutely amazing. So, Cole, just before we get into the meat of it, right, let's tell everyone, what is this book about? Clearly Invisible in Paris. What is this book about? Who is it about? Why did you write it? Yeah. Okay. So, you know, three of us have been so involved in digging deep and like analyzing and breaking down all these texts and really being self-indulgent like that. Please show them so, how many notes there are in your book. Also. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not going to. <laughs> so, but I just want to simplify it and not ruin any spoilers. So just that the, when we get into the depth of the conversation, you can actually follow. So it's called Clearly Invisible in Paris. And no, it's not a memoir because I'm not invisible ever anywhere. Okay. <laughs> so um, although this is the point, I have lived in Bombay, Delhi, London, Tokyo. But when I moved to Paris, I felt completely alienated. Like it was... I was like, okay, it's just a question of language. I come from Delhi, you know, the Delhi snobs. I know how to deal with Paris, no issue. And it's just a matter of time, I will get in. But continuously, till date, feel like an outsider. It is the most alienating city. It is a city of polarity, which is why I also love it as a writer. It is at one end, oh, the most egalitarian society, and yet the most divided city. We see that in the riots, we see that everywhere. It is the city of love. And yet, it is the coldest city. Anyone who's been a tourist in uh, Paris knows that. It is um, a city where they talks about, you know, oh, we're so liberal, we're so inclusive. And yet, it's a city that's so insular. Paris is the greatest, we are the greatest, no one else. I don't want this to become a Paris bashing session. We have a Frenchman here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> My husband, thank Oh, you. yeah, sorry. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> two, two. <laughs> thank you, Laurent, for taking me to Paris, which made me write this story. Because it's also a city that I love. Every time I'm dejected by my life there, I look around at the cityscape, there is no city like Paris. And so therefore, the desire to want to fit in. And it wasn't just me. Everyone that I was meeting around me had a similar story to tell. Like amazing, fabulous women, men, 
who were all just trying to fit in. We were outsiders. And you don't normally think of immigrants as people like me. You know, you just don't. You think of them as people standing in a line and refugees or poorer or a different, I don't know, different socioeconomic background, but I'm an immigrant. I am very much an immigrant and I'm made to feel like that in this city. And I developed these amazing friendships. And somewhere I have this knack of maybe attracting stories. People come and tell me things they really shouldn't, like there's a lot of oversharing that happens. And, but there is, what can I say? Strangers, friends, all kind of things. And it all fed into me and then one day I was writing this story about odd friendships that see you through. And at the end of it, I don't want to ruin anything more. I'll tell you a little bit about the characters. But it says clearly Invisible in Paris, and there's a big point in it that, you know, who gets to be Parisian, who doesn't. And I have to say I'm very happy to be, finally, after all this trying to be, very happy to be an Indian in Paris, <laughs> right? That is, that is something that I have finally owned and gone, I am Indian in Paris, I don't want to be you Parisian people. So this story is about four very disparate women. <clears throat> One of them is Neera, who is an Indian socialite who moves to Paris because she gets married to an aging uh, French movie director producer. But she can't, she can't adjust to her life because she has so many issues of her own, which when you read about her, you're like, what is your problem in life? But that's the problem. She has nothing to complain about and everything to complain about. The, other, the next character is Roselle, who is a Filipina housemaid uh, who escapes the clutches of her Kuwaiti uh, employer who basically thought that being an all-rounder means being a slave. Um, and then you have Dasha, who's a barely 17-year-old Russian who comes, who's insta-scouted from a tiny little village in Russia who comes to Paris to want to be a supermodel. And you have Violet, who is this burlesque dancer from Senegal. She's a transgender woman. She is fabulous in every way, but she is broke. All three of the, all four of these women live in the same Haussmann building. Now, for those of you who don't know Paris, Paris has these stunning, you know, Haussmann buildings, and they, they live in different circumstances. So Roselle lives in this tiny six by six, you know, room in the roof, which you have to access with a spiral staircase at the back of the house. Uh, Neera, the Indian socialite, lives in a duplex in the middle with you know, double floors done by Philip Stark. Um, Dasha lives in a room full of bunk beds with other models who are trying to make it. And um, Violet lives in the ground floor next to the lift. They don't know each other, they don't want to know each other, they can't stand each other, there's nothing in common. Except they're all foreign. And then the world comes to a standstill. When you read the book, you'll understand why. And when that happens, they're the only people left who are able to see each other through. And this is where, what the book is about, right? It's funny, it's in your face, it's me, um, you know, in that sense, but it's completely fictionalized and there will be conversations that we will have about these characters. Absolutely. But this will. kind of lays the, the lay of the land is this. Just tell the names again, there's Neera. There's Neera the Indian, there is Dasha, the Russian uh, wannabe model, there's Violet, who is the burlesque dancer, and there is Roselle. Roselle. Meet right. little Roselle. Amazing. Yeah. So one of the things I loved in all our conversations, and honestly it was such a delight to hear because we have on these multiple email chains, was that when Suhana was doing the notes, because she's like a reader herself and really deeply invested into it, taught you insights about your writing that you didn't know. And that's literally the highest compliment all the writers here would know, is when someone points out something that you didn't do on purpose, maybe, or didn't realize you did. So I'd love to know what was like your favorite part of the book? What are some of the things that really stood out to you where you're like, and that's, that's, the, that's the meat of it, you know? There's always a great story. But when you find something that you're like, oh wow, did I find that? And I think you did for Coyle. Um, I mean, I don't know if this was intentional and I don't want to like give away any spoilers <laughs> or anything because there was so much that I loved about the book. But I think in terms of your writing, um, I just loved the way you used juxtaposition throughout the book and like right from the get-go the title of the book is clearly invisible in Paris and those the clear and invisible those antithetical terms you know yeah. they just kind of lay the you know they kind of just lay the narrative out there for the reader already from the beginning because yeah you know that this book, it kind of highlights the contradictory nature of the book. And I think 
That was my favorite part of the book was this paragraph that you wrote about duality, the inseparability of contradiction and how basically um, light doesn't exist without darkness or um, uh, there is no winter without summer. You can't feel uh, happiness without having felt sadness and essentially just stating that there is no good without the bad. So I think that was a very hopeful paragraph because it just kind of shows that there's a balance in the world. But then more than anything, I found that it ties in with all the characters of the book and how they are so different and how they are such opposites of one another. They're all foils of one another, the four main characters, Violet, Dasha, Neera and Roselle just reiterating it for everyone. Um, but they're so opposite and they're so different and I somewhere like to believe that that's what attracted them to one another. I like the whole idea of opposites attracting and opposites complementing each other. Like, you know, in real life you see two, like a couple and they're so different but they go so well That's together. Like chopping and cheese. Yeah. yeah, that we kind of seek things in other people that we don't find in ourselves. Yeah. Um, so I love that. I love that you complete me kind of a thing. But this, this part that you talk about the contradiction, the inseparability of yeah. contradiction, it is actually in reference to Dasha, the younger girl, whatever happens, starts looking up to Violet as this character that, you know, can be a Mama V or whatever. And she thinks, when I grow up, I want to be Violet. And one day she's, this is not a spoiler, one day she happens to be in her little apartment, which is of all things sparkly. And she opens, uh, you know, she doesn't have anything to do, so she opens the cupboards. And it's full of um, gender transforming pills and of hormones and of all the things that go into making Violet, Violet, right? And so Dasha is like, no, this is, I love the fact that she's male and female energy and that matches and, and this is the biggest power that the universe can have and nothing. But she can't get her, her head around the fact that she's actually a creation of something that she's not the body that she wanted to be and there is this contradiction of it and it's a really dark point but I'm glad you got hope out of it yeah, you know <laughs> because that's what makes Violet yeah. so beautiful that she's this contradiction that she's male and female I guess. right so and it's a, but this is it. this is exactly what we were talking about Suhana that when we spoke the first time like and this is true Rajat you know that like when you make any, whether it's a painting, a film, a book, or anything, you kind of do what you can, you finish it, you seal it, but till the audience or the receiver or the viewer, uh, you know, interprets it, views it, it's not complete, and that is always so subjective. There are things they see in it that you didn't even intend, and for me, that has been, I can't tell you the early readers who have read the book and the things they've come up with, and they were like this, and I was like, I wrote that, like I didn't mean it like that, but yeah, okay, that's fabulous. How did you guys become friends? I know you work together, but again, it's a very beautiful, unexpected, accidental friendship, right? You know, there's a line in my book, and I don't, this is genuinely, it applies to you. Um, there is a line where one of the characters says, finally discovers there is a difference between confidence and self-acceptance, right? And when we're younger, that difference is very, like it's blurred because you're confident and you accept yourself and stuff. And, and the first time I saw Suhana walking on set, maybe she was nervous, I don't know, it was very early days and stuff, yeah, but there were, that line so didn't exist. True. And as I'm getting older, I have that line very clear, you know, there's a diff I am very confident. Do I accept myself? Well, I don't know. So a lot of the characters are like that. When I saw Suhana, she was very clearly confident and you know, full of self-acceptance. So for me, it was a almost instant, like, I'm going to be your friend. Hmm. There you are. For me. <laughs> She's like, mm, let me tell you my side of the story. <laughs> when I first met Koyal, I was like, she scares me. <laughs> You're not alone. I was like, she... Raise your hand if Koyal scares I, you. I was terrified <laughs> of Koyal. I Lara, like, you're not allowed. <laughs> she was like, she was like, no one I've ever met before. And I was like, I don't know how to respond to her. I was like, she's going to eat me alive. Yes. I swear, that's my first impression of you. And as, as we, I swear, as we got to know each other and as I spent more time with you, 
I feel like she brought out this really sassy side to me that not a lot of people get to see and I really enjoyed that and also I, I learned that she's you know into plays and writing plays and in our breaks like literally on set she'd be writing a play and making her own stuff and I thought that was so um, inspiring I'm complimenting you now because I, I called I you scary you. earlier <laughs> please <laughs> note that. But because I'm so <laughs> terrified, I love it. No, I'm not. I love that Koel doesn't though. know she's no, scary. I'm, no. I'm kind of amazing that she has no. Yeah, Koel, you're terrifying. I just want to put it out there. In a good way, though. Koel, this is actually an intervention. The book is just a good. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm joking, obviously. Yeah. But it was literally you talking about, you know, people wouldn't expect you to feel like an immigrant or feel like an outsider. But when I saw you, it was like you just exuded this self-confidence and you were just powerful, I would say. The difference between self-confidence and self-acceptance, right? <laughs> so there is a difference. And because I don't want to be bashed anymore, I'm going to read a bit. Can I? Read you can. I was about, read my mind. I was about to say, I, I think it's time to hear some of the sassy savagery, sexiness that she's poured into this book. But I'm not sure it's a, because, you know, what do you read, like how do you read something without anyone having read the book and all that, so I don't want to ruin a lot of things. But I like this bit only because it plays into this idea of invisibility and visibility, which is a big deal, you know, because when, when I was like a 17-year-old moving to UK for the first time to study, yes, I was a popular, confident child and kid and I went there and I was like, what is wrong with me? No one is looking at me, like, what's going on? And then I realized that in India, we're so used to everyone always looking at everyone all the time that when someone is just minding their business, you think you're invisible. And I was like, okay, this is, this is not, you know. So this kind of um, feeds into this. Of course, I don't have my glasses because I'm too vain, so we will try. Ah, so this is Neera. I'm not going to tell you anything more, but she's got a secret and She's trying basically to get back into her um, apartment, into her building. She has to cross the street with this secret to get back in there. And she's feeling rather visible. She always wants to be visible, but this is the one moment she wishes that she was invisible, right? <coughs> so this is where she is. <clears throat> this was her neighborhood. They were all there, the boulanger with his bay, big bay window flaunting his assortment of artisanal venoiserie and his contempt for those who ordered the wrong pastry at the wrong time of the day. By the way, this has happened to me all the time. Order a croissant in the anything but the morning and you've had it, right? Um, the dry cleaner who made it clear that she preferred chatting with her gang of delivery boys than attending to dirty clothes. And the Tunisian guy from the overpriced fruit shop. All of them insisted on greeting her every time she passed. This peculiarity of Paris, constantly saying hello and goodbye to everyone, only to render them invisible straight after, had always maddened her. What purpose did politesse serve when you had no intention of actually acknowledging a person or their needs? In Mumbai, you never bothered with salutations. You just cut to the chase. And no matter how hard you tried, you could never be invisible. There was always eyes on you. And there was always someone more than ready to dive into your life and impose their assistance. Though she was nothing more than a bonjour to these vendors on most days, today she was sure that they would notice her and her secret. You know, I see, I love that there's so many notes in your Suhan. I would love to know one of your favorite bits and if you would love to do a reading for us. I would, it's so interesting also. As I'm hearing you and the characters are coming to life so beautifully, we all read books in our own voices, right? And it's so interesting how you picture. That's why the, the movie's never as good as the book, because your imagination is that theater of the mind. So I would love to hear one of your favorite bits. I think my favorite part of the book is, um, I think it's between Neera and Violet. And uh, Neera sort of, they're talking about home and what it, how they don't, belong in Paris and how they don't even feel belonged in their, they don't even feel like they belong in their own home, uh, wherever they yeah. come from. And I think Violet says something like, home is nothing but two arms holding you tight. She does when, know all the <laughs> When you are at your worst, and I think that was such a like, true statement because I, I mean, I've 
studied in the UK and, and New York as well and I feel like it wasn't the place, it was more the people that kind of made it home and the friendships that I made. And you have your own immigrant story about this as well, right? Like I mean, I wouldn't say I was really an immigrant at all. Outsider in, story. Um, I, was, I was in boarding school and I went when I was 15 years old. I left home when I was 15. So I think that was very um, scary because it was definitely a culture shock. And I think it took me a while to feel at home. And when I did, it was because of the people there and how their friendship and their love made me feel seen when I kind of felt invisible. Um, <laughs> Cole's gonna cry for sure. I am going to So yeah, I really resonated with when uh, Violet said that mm. about home feeling like a person yeah. more than I love place. that. You There's know. another line. <laughs> well, this is the moment that they met, not to spoil it. But there's a line that you write that says, Biryani brought them together. Oh. Or Biryani brings people together. Yeah. And that's how they, that was their kind of first meeting, like their, their first meal together was Neera cooked them some biryani and they all were kind of eating biryani together. And when you wrote that, I got so excited because it's my favorite food and like, I need that, that line on a t-shirt because I was so There you go, your book merch is ready. Who wants a t-shirt that says biryani brought us together? I'm in, I'm in for that. Let's biryani do brings people together, that you're right. That was my favorite part of it. Oh yeah, but that is, I have to it say I so loved cute. writing that part because there's a flood that happens, it's all happening in the same building, no one is there except these four women, they don't know that they kind of exist even. Everyone's busy. I don't want to ruin anything for you about that, but they're all busy. Neera is a B-I-T-C-H. I mean, she's really awful, right, to everyone and everything, but she's alone and for whatever reasons. And then because these women are helping her with the flood, she's like, I made biryani, and that's not a dish you eat alone, you know? <laughs> and it's literally like, 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 like that. And, and then eventually when you sit and you eat, they become yeah. buddies. All right, a vote of thanks. Yes, from I'd like to thank, obviously, these two wonderful women out here, Miss Malini, although I always call you Miss Malini. Uh, <laughs> Ma Miss Malini, always Miss Malini. Uh, Malini, thank you. Thank, thank you pleasure. for, you know, in the, before we started today, I was like, oh, really, where do I need to sit? I suddenly went into panic mode. I have done this hundreds of times, but when you're doing it for yourself, I'm like in panic, and she's like, I got you, babe, I got you. And this is friendship, right? And so Hana, who has come out of, you know, just stepped out of her comfort zone to be here with me and you look so comfortable. Like, thank you. Thank you, Joanna means the world. And we did, um, you know, I wrote in her book, can I share that? Yeah. I, I wrote in a book that we are now tied by destiny because she is helping me launch my debut novel. And I, she did her first ever shot on film with me. So we are tied by destiny. So thank you. Thank you.